we can just do some quick introductions. We're just about on time. So my name's Kate, I'm the director of The Big Draw, and I am very excited to have Vincent on the call with us today. And we'll be talking all about, uh, well, I think what drawing means for you, Vincent, but you've got lots of other, there's lots yes. of other things that we want to thread out. So obviously you're, you have a close uh, relationship with the society, so we'll be talking a little bit about that, but lots of other things to cover. So let's just have a look. So it's 6.32. I think, I think we'll kick off, shall we? Shall yes, we start sure Okay then, so welcome Vincent. Welcome to the Big Draw Instagram Live Drawn in Conversation series. So Thank you. <laughs> as you know, we've been doing these um, probably every other week now since last June. That's quite so, a feat. <laughs> yeah, I know. I couldn't, I, somebody told me I'd done like 20 or something the day and I couldn't quite believe it. But, but where to start? I mean, there's so much to cover. I mean, I, maybe I need to put my glasses on for this one because there's so much to go through. Yeah, I mean, well, I think, to their club. Because <laughs> I know I could chat with you all day. Shall we start? Shall we start when you were little? Because when I was talking to you the other day, you had some lovely little stories. There was a story that you told me, because obviously you were passionate about drawing. You know, it was the yes. classic, could never put the pencil down constantly. And there was a couple of stories there that you had. So there's one around the furniture, which I share with you, that whole secretive drawing on furniture on the wall or hidden behind furniture, and then the, you move Oh, the that's boat. right. There that's was right. that. And, and you were also talking about how from a very early age, you, you know, you would draw and make and design your own toys and everything. But just tell us a little bit from when you were very small, this early passion that you had for, for mark making. You just wanted to get that pencil in your hand and get Well, it. Well, basically, um, I think, it, because I was born born severely deaf, and um, so I couldn't really talk, talk properly until I was about seven and a half. And at three, the men in white coats at Great Ormond Street diagnosed me as someone with learning difficulties. And uh, it wasn't until I went to a dentist with my mother, we were, we were in the reception, my name was called, my mother said, I'm terribly sorry, he uh, has learning difficulties. And there was a lady in reception who had a son with learning difficulties and she'd been watching him and she said, well, he's very clean. He seems very bright to me. Mm. I think he may have a problem with his hearing. So <coughs> we were referral to uh, a man in Tottenham who was a Polish RAF um, man, a doctor, and it took him four seconds. He looked in his ear, no passage. He said, this child is deaf. No one looked in his ears. He was horrified. So I used to just go to school for painting and drawing, basically, for a while, and um, part-time. And I was always playing with Lego, I was always making things, I loved drawing things, and painting things, but I spent a lot of time drawing, a uh, very visual world that I'm in. And um, basically, it wasn't until I was about five that uh, my mother discovered that I could draw because in, uh, in our council house in Potter's Bar, where we lived at the time, she and my grandmother were pulling the fridge out and, and, and pulling everything out of the kitchen for my dad to do the decorating. And they saw this draw very detailed drawing of a man on the wall behind the fridge. So they were standing there trying to work out who did it. Or was that, was that Vincent's older poet? No, that's not too good for him. Um, was it so and so and so? No. And I was standing there bright red with a smile on my face. And, mm -hmm. and then the penny drop it was neat. And then they realised that I could draw. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, it's got me through life. I mean, every day virtually, I mean, I, I draw. I'm either drawing or sketching. And, um, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's makes me feel connected. It's very important to me. It's very much interpreting what I see and expressing what I see with marks and line. I like to depict things fairly accurately, although maintain character of the drawing. But the wonderful thing about drawing, which I think should be mandatory for all children to learn, is it teaches you to look, it teaches you to observe, and it <coughs> develops an analytical mind. So when you're looking at things, you're analysing what you're looking at. Yeah. Um, so that, from that point of view, um, drawing has been a huge part of my life because um, I went on from there, we moved to Kent, I uh, went to a prep school, I was two years behind at that school at one point, in the same class as my sister, my poor sister, and um, 
and they knew then that I could draw. I remember doing a big Mickey Mouse cartoon. I think it was about a two size, something like that. And uh, the, the, the teacher said to my parents, Vince is very good at art, you know, very good at drawing. And for, for a deaf child who basically had largely been written off as someone with learning difficulties, and they were not used to having deafness in the family, you know, it, it gave them hope because they didn't really know what they were going to do with me. <laughs> um, so I went to secondary school. I went back to my year, uh, skipped. I jumped back into two years, went to the bottom class, went up within half term for English, two years later from that. But um, I came top in art every time except for one, and it was nearly always drawing. Uh, I'd be drawing buildings, people, things out of imagination. Um, I had a very good uh, teacher as a, as a sort of in a remedial class, so to speak, that I got on by with and became my form teacher. He was a very good artist too, and I remember doing figure drawing with him, drawing my classmates, and I did really well at that. I loved that. And I liked our art teacher a lot, and turned out that he was in the same profession that I ended up in. Um, but he always used to say, Vince, they used to leave me to my own devices. Well, I've got some things set up on the table. Here's a pencil, here's some paper, go and draw it. So I'd be left to my own devices to draw it. Oh. Um, and I, I really, I learned to speak very well because of a bone conductor hearing aid I had. I couldn't wear in the ear hearing aids at all. Um, and the, I had amazing bone conduction. It was a headband, a black box, and wire, and I had this constant pressure on my skull. And by the time I got to 14, it caused dents in my skull, gave me terrible headache. So I had an in, in the ear, behind the ear hearing aid, and I couldn't really hear my own voice. Um, so I felt pretty isolated in many ways, but I used to just lose myself in, in my drawing, in my artwork. So <coughs> it was a lifeline for me. Um, can, I, so if I, can I just want to unpick some of that before we carry on, if I, if I may, Vincent? Yes. Because there's, there's so much in there. Um, I mean, I would, I'd, like to, I'd like to come back, I, I want to come back to the drawing more in a lot, yeah. in, in a much more of a meteor way um, later on. But there, there was a couple of things in there. So there was the whole thing around... Well, I mean, a, a child who is deaf and it not being picked up. I mean, it was picked up by luck, wasn't it, really? You were lucky yeah. that somebody happened to say, actually, I think this child might be deaf. Very lucky. Be deaf. Um, so, I mean, you know, that's something in itself. And I know that I won't say the year it was. We don't like to reveal our age, do we? <laughs> <Sorry. I'm worried. laughs> but, um, you know, we'd like to think that obviously times have changed, but certainly at that time, it did happen. You know, children were put in institutions and they were often left to their own devices, not they necessarily were. for the well best. Yes. Yeah. So they, they were written off. They were written off, yes. Were written off. yes. A absolutely. But when I remember when we spoke before, you talked a lot about this uh, when you were little and actually obviously the frustration, the frustration of obviously being of being profoundly deaf. And obviously I mean you you know, you talk about it in a, and it's really, you know, this it it's very it's not just something a little behind the ears. You're a child and you've got this contraption on your head. I mean, that must have been incredibly difficult, I think, as a, as a child. And, and when we talked, you talked about the frustrations of all of this and, and how drawing really was, well, it was creative. It was something you knew you were good at, but it was really a way for you to deal with what was happening around you. And as a way of escape. It was escapism. That's right. A way of communicating. Very much so. It very much was. So. And it, it was... A way, or it's a way of me feeling much more part of the world instead of being in this isolated thing. I mean, I grew up in a very lively, gregarious family. So, I mean, although I was quite shy, you were not allowed to be a <laughs> wallflower. Didn't get a chance. But, no, but the drawing actually gave me the confidence. I mean, as a child, if you have these difficulties, I mean, I used to have to deal with bullying, all sorts of things, um, oh, yes. which is part of life. I went to a normal school. I could have gone to a special school for the deaf, for grammar school, which would have been sending me away from home. And I think in hindsight, my parents were right, because going to a normal school, being the only deaf child for a lot of the time until later in secondary school, where we had another deaf child join us. And um, it... It makes you a bit more streetwise. It also helps educate the kids around you that you're a normal person who just happens to be deaf. Yeah. Um, 
But yes, my, my, my school nickname was Van Gogh, uh, because, you know, obvious reasons with my hearing, and, and it didn't really feel with yeah, my ears at all. But I used to get terribly frustrated, especially when I was little, because I used to try to say things to my mother, and she wouldn't understand. She would then say something, and I couldn't hear her. I couldn't understand her. So I used to throw myself on the floor in a tantrum, and it was just frustration. Um, so no way would that be learning difficulties. And... Um, and I had specialists when I was 10 to assess what to do, whether, you know, with my <coughs> state education. Uh, one was a senior deaf specialist and education specialist, another one was a child psychologist. And, and they um, turned around to my mother, do you know that your child lip reads? She said, no. Has he been taught? And no. So they mouthed a question and I answered. And then they put a piece of paper over their mouths and asked me something, I ignored them. And they said, this child is anything but um, having learning difficulties, he's very bright. <laughs> um, so I think really, I didn't do brilliantly academically at school um, because I've missed so much. I mean, I've really, I've missed more than two years, really. Yeah. And, um, but and I not knew all children are asked. academic and that's not the only way to, um, to weight um, intelligence, is it? It's a, it's I very, think you're very, absolutely um, right. I mean, I've worked in with my career, which we'll come on to later, I've worked with some incredibly intelligent people who are not academic, they're brilliant problem solvers, they're very good at practical things, and being creative and emotional intelligence, all of those things. Academic intelligence is just a small part, um, but it's all about um, being useful in life and, and fulfilling your potential as a person. It's not about exams, it's what you do no. with it that counts. It is. And I, and I think that, I mean, I look back now with horror because, I mean, you were saying about, you know, you would put, there was the remedial, you sort of put out the remedial class. And I remember I went to a grammar school and um, and I was lucky enough to be in one of the top classes. But I look back now and I think we were really horrible. We were horrible. There was, they, and also the, the school, the school put all the classes, the, the, the remedial classes, they thought were on the very bottom in the really dingy corridor by the smelly boys' toilets. <laughs> and you just didn't go there. It was like, oh no, no, we don't go to, we don't. It was so horrible. Do you know, we called, we called it the Remy Corridor. And I look back now, I just think, oh my God, that's just so awful. But it was, it was sort of ingrained. It was ingrained in us. You know, you talk about bullying and what children are like and everything. If you're segregated into different groups, that's what you see and it's what you hear, isn't it? And That's right. I look back now and anyway, I mean, whole different story there. But the, from, from what you're saying is you, this contraption that you had in your head from where I understood it when we spoke the other day was, it was actually very effective. It did help. It um, I could put it anywhere on my skull or on my yeah. back. So, and though I, it was yeah. unwieldy and obviously, you know, very frustrating for us, especially as a child, it did help. And that alongside learning to lip read, you were able to begin to communicate uh, verbally. That's right. Absolutely. Alongside, obviously, your, your drawing, your, your visual communication. So things were able to sort of move along. One thing that um, struck me, because we were talking a little bit, we touched on, if you remember, a little bit about this idea of, of un the unseen. I don't know, maybe people would say that deafness is, is or isn't a, dis a disability, and I'm not here to say what the labelling is, but it's an unseen thing. And I remember you, you saying to me that... Um, even today, some people don't believe that you're deaf. Oh which, no, I've had and that. Because you communicate so well, and it's almost like, oh no, he's just saying that. You know, it's a badge, right. a badge of honor. And I mean, again, I mean, as somebody who has, I have OCD and it's a hidden thing, that really grates with me. It's, um, well, it there does. are I, unseen things out there. I had it in a, I had it in a spoken English exam. I mean, there I was with a hearing aid. I was told to tell the assessor that I'm deaf, and she wouldn't believe me. She just wouldn't believe me. And yet, I've been to see a hospital consultant who's never met me before. He reads through my files, and I get this, hello, Mr. Matthews, how are we? Right. I was Even now. But I'm perfectly fine, thank you very much. And he nearly fell off his chair. What, he speaks? Yeah. I can't believe it, he oh, speaks so well. And I explained it to him. Um, so I think the thing that I'm always amazed with, and things like drawing, creating things, are a great outlet for people who have these things to deal with. But I'm always staggered with the human spirit and how we adapt 
and how we, um, I mean, it is resilience as well, but I think we adapt and how we move forward with things. And, you know, we think, okay, we can't do that, but we'll do something else or we'll do it another way. Because, um, I mean, apart from my deafness, I also have five fingers on my hand. I don't have a proper thumb. Yeah. So I can't grip so well. It's pretty perfect for drawing with a pen perfect and a pencil. Perfect for drawing. That's yeah. it. Yeah, perfect. So it's, we all have these little foibles. Um, yeah, yeah. But, and so, I really like, I'd like to come back to the um, this idea, because another thing that we touched on was that, and it, it, it's interesting because I've spoken to friends and colleagues about this who are deaf as well, or or they're going blind as well. And they talk about how your perceptions in a, your inner world, your perceptions in terms of visual thinking, visual literacy, writing, conceiving, drawing, can become very enriched, even if one sense starts to go, the others. So it'd be really interesting to hear more about that. But I'm sure that people are wanting to know what happened next, because obviously the little boy grew up very talented and did develop a really very incredibly successful career. And um, do you want to talk a bit more about that? Well, yes. What, what, happened, mean, what happened? Um, well, what happened next was basically I knew when I left school I wanted to do something to do with art or design, and, and if I couldn't do that, I'd do cabinet making. And um, so I applied to go to Croydon Art College for a two-year foundation course. I was not even sixteen when I went with my dad to meet them, and they were all impressed with my work. In fact. Um, the head of the course got several tutors in. Look at this young lad's work. Look, you know, and uh, I explained I've missed a lot of schooling. They said, well, I'll give you a provisional place. Don't worry, it's a two-year course. We'll help you catch up with your academic studies. Um, don't worry about that. It's a provisional place. And the, the sad thing is that three days due, before I was due to start, uh, someone who'd never met me, never saw my work, who was an academic, decided to turn me down so I then had to go to a college I absolutely hated for a year which was West, Ed West Kent College it was further education to me it was worse than school and I was doing A-level art there I had a very dogmatic teacher who was very good at coaching on the drawings demolished my confidence on painting even though I'd done a very um, successful oil painting commission at the age of 16 before going there but anyway, so I applied to go to Maystone Art College, did a foundation course there, got on, and uh, loved it. Happiest year of my life that was. I absolutely loved it. We got to try everything. And you know, we joined fine art, did a bit of graphics, did a lot of life drawing, uh, mm. sculpture, uh, printmaking, etching. I mean, my very first etching I did there, one of the tutors liked it so much, he asked if he could keep it. And it was just out of my head. It was doing an aerial view of skyscrapers and cars going round and round in circles. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was very humorous. Um, and the course director there, he was, he, he only retired, I think, about six, seven years ago. And uh, he had all these qualifications. Very nice man, bother boots, swore like a trooper. And uh, he said, look, Vincent, as far as we're concerned, you've got the qualifications you need. So they wanted me to do fine art. Uh, my dad was very worried because we, he grew up, he'd been running his own business and all the problems with that. He wanted me to have a secure job. And my uncle was a very good architect, old school architect, who I take after in many ways. Um, he was very good at drawing. And uh, he said, well, look, you know, you're always making things, you're always drawing, you're always designing things. Why don't you go into interior design? So um, I went along for an interview, met the head of the course, uh, Ted Alden. And I, I wasn't really an interview once, I just went along to have a look at the college, actually. And I had my sketchbook with me. He looked at my sketchbook, we were talking for an hour, and said, um, yeah, how would you like to do this course? I mean, if I offered you a place, would you do it? So I said, yeah, of course I will. And I excelled in the first year because I was doing all the architectural stuff, which I absolutely loved. Second year wasn't so easy because they were doing more sort of decorating, which wasn't really my thing. And then I started to have problems with the infection because at the age of eight, I was a guinea pig. The top consultants around the UK operated on me to try to give me hearing and failed miserably. And he caught up with me later in my teens. So I had this terrible ear infection for three years. Uh, but anyway, the long and the short of it is... Um, uh, and my, my last week of my course, we'd had our assessments at uh, Covent Garden and we had um, a chap who used to teach at uh, Kingston, come from the SIAD, which is now the Society of Childhood Designers, 
and uh, it says there, well, he was so impressed with everything I'd done that uh, he recommended me to a friend, a designer, who in turn recommended me to Chester Jones. And I went to work for Chester. Loved it. It was working with Chester and Clyde Butch. I learned so much. We were a small team. We were part of Colfax and Fowler, but we did a lot of the commercial work as well as some of the interesting period work. So it was a broad range. So it was all drawing. It was furniture as well. Also. And I loved it. And I learned so much from them both. And I was absolutely, and I was working at a drawing board. Um, doing lots of full size details on drawing board, technical drawings, you know, working out plans and elevations, going on site, that kind of thing. And, uh, and then Chester decided to leave uh, at about, oh, must, well, it must have been 1990s, it's going back a long way. So it would have been about nine years after I joined and Clive had left before that. So we'd, we'd been made part of Colfax at that point. And I became associate director, senior designer. And, um, and then eventually we were asked to form a team, William Hodgson himself. He was my very close friend and colleague. And uh, so, yeah, we, we became the, uh, the design studio for Civil Colfax on Fowler Limited. Mm. And we worked on some amazing projects. Having worked on amazing projects with Chester too, I did a once in a lifetime Gothic library with Chester. Was that, so is that one of your favorite <laughs> The library. Sorry? One of your favourites, the library? Yeah, oh, it is, because I, it was four years of my life, and I had to do a lot of research, even to the point I was walking around in the dark looking at Tunbridge Castle, and studying what the <laughs> profiles were. Um, and, um, and we worked with the best uh, craftsmen and tradesmen. They had to get a lot of men out of their retirement who were in their 70s to train up the apprentices to make the hammer beams. Um, because they restored York Minster using all the old medieval tools. Um, it was incredible. There were models made of it. So, and actually, one of my drawings, well, two of my drawings actually for that job are in the Colfax book. Um, and it's been on TV as well. I can't say where it is, but it has been on TV as well. So a lot of the work I do, no one knows I do it. It's all behind the scenes. Mm. But in the design world, I'm very well known for my drawings. Um, and yeah, so when you were doing this job, so just so for my benefit, but for just people on the call as well, um, imagining you in, let's say, the, the library space, for example, it's almost like I imagine the role as the, you know, as a, the interior architect, really, the, the role as almost the facilitator between all the different, you know, you need somebody that understands the overview, can draw it out, but somebody who can make, who can sort of talk to both the, the builders, that can talk to the architects, that can talk to you. You need to have yes. that, that person in the middle. You do. That's got that, on that, that sort of brain. particular job, I worked with some really good architects, really good architects worked that yeah. job. And I had a very good rapport with their, their project manager architect, um, which helped. Um, and I was very much doing that job under Chester Jones, because I mean, it was his concept. And I did a lot of research and full size detail. There were 75 drawings for that one room. Gosh. And I, you know, I did all the iron railings, all the bookcases, which had to have air conditioning in, I had to detail all the ceilings. So, you know, I was very much working for and with Chester. But as time evolved, um, I, I basically was very much the coordinating man. I mean, mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of the concept design sketches, usually working with William, but I did a lot of that. And then I'd do a lot of the plans and elevations, and I would supervise people in the studio, giving them sketch details of what they've got to draw up and working out junctions for them. And at the same time, I'd have to liaise with the interior decorator because we worked very closely with the interior decorators at Colfax. I worked with a lot of the, the best ones there. And then um, also then had to liaise with the client, had to liaise with listed buildings, liaise with planning, with building regs, fire officer, and then you'd have to also deal with um, sometimes with landlords as well. Uh, all of that, and then you're dealing with builders, joiners, stonemasons, marble masons, specialist mm -hmm. plasterers, um, metal workers, f uh, fibrous plaster, and you're having to design everything. And it all has to be set out to, you know, to the nearest millimetre. And uh, one job could have 200 drawings, A1, Go and on. it could be between four to six years of your life, which is a huge mm -hmm. commitment. Yeah. So, I, so really, I was off in the... You were successful, weren't you? And you really worked your way up. I mean, I've, there's a little quote here that I, I wrote down from when we chatted the other week. And you said, um, 
a role in the job got more about management and less about your original passions. It Absolutely. clicked and I rediscovered that a big chunk of myself was missing. Okay. Leads us quite nicely into I, I, something. I've been working on a very, very uh, prestigious job in Newmarket, and I wasn't having the best experience. With, you know, because but I loved working with the guys I was working with. Yeah. Uh, but it was a difficult time for me. I was away from home a lot, and after certain things happened, I was really fed up. And I remember talking to my friend, the site manager there at the time, Greg, who was wonderful. And I was looking really for another way out, um, and and I, I was missing. And I, and I used to do a lot of drawing on site. I still do from time to time because that's where drawing comes into its own. It's problem solving on site. What do I do yeah. here? What do I do there? Um, which I was good at, and I was, it has always been my life. It was all consuming designers at uh, that world. It just takes over your life completely. I didn't really have much of a personal life. It was all there. But it was 2003, the oil painting commission I did at 16 of this dog I didn't particularly like uh, came back to me because the lady I painted before died. And I was talking to, um, you know, in our office at the time, it was mostly women. I was talking to um, the, P, the bossy PA, and she said, oh, right. bring, bring a photograph of it in. So I took a photo, I took it in, thinking nothing of it. And I was sitting there at my drawing board and answering phone calls and things. And, um, and it had gone around the whole building. And then I get the lady from Textile Design Studio coming, what are you doing here? You're wasted. Why do you ever stop this? And anyway, um, it was such encouragement. And, uh, and my colleague then said, well, they do some very good courses at City Lit. Why don't you go and do those? So I agreed. I went and did uh, advanced um, oil painting uh, at City Lit, evening classes, three hours a, a, a week, basically. And I was very, very nervous, not very confident. But I was so lucky because Chris Hoff was my first tutor there, who subsequently played a, played a very important role. Um, later on in my studies and he encouraged me and he said you paint just like I do the classical way how dare that man demolish your confidence when you were doing your A-level art how dare he um, but anyway I have got hooked and I went into life painting courses I used to leave the studio now it's a very respectable company Dolphins of Fowler quite a big yeah. name mm -hmm. and um, quite posh really and uh, I would leave the, um, the office in paint splattered jeans, paint splattered t-shirt and trousers, and walk down to the, to my um, life painting um, class with great big uh, um, portfolio, and uh, I was absolutely passionate about it. I absolutely loved it, and it really confirmed to me what I'd been missing in my life. I felt like a whole part of me had been shut off until that point. And um, I've had several things that happened during that time. And one thing led to another. And, and I remember walking down to the station from um, City Lit once down the Strand. And I had a clear plastic folder with this big naked lady in it. And I was getting all these laughs and giggles and snorkels as I was walking past. And I went in, I thought, oh, I need something to eat. So I went to this pizza place to get something to eat. And I didn't realise I had crimson red paint all down my arm. So this, I suddenly heard this waitress scream and she was going to call for the ambulance. And I had to say, uh, why? Well, you've got blood on your arm. Oh, no, that's pain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it went from one thing to another. So I just did a lot of these short courses at Bolt Court and at Sturdy Court and then later Keeley Court. And um, I basically went on to do landscape, uh, urban landscape with Simon English sketching and taking back the sketches and work for him, which is how I work now. Wow. And I uh, did live painting with him, did live painting with Sean Dawson, who went on to become head of painting at London Met. And he was convinced that the Gulf Actual Road that I was going to end up in Montmartre in Paris with a ballet painting. And, um, and anyway, Simon English said, well, why don't you sign up for the City Lit Fine Art course? Um, try it. And I thought about it. It was a contemporary course. It was very contemporary. And uh, so I went along for the interview and it was Chris Hoff again and I had the interview with And it was just like seeing a long lost friend. We just had such a wonderful time. And I showed him all this work and he said, well, look, it's up to you. But, uh, you know, you, 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 the place is yours, but you've got to decide whether you want to do this because it's, it's contemporary. This is quite, it's quite temporary. And I said, well, I'm quite happy to 
try new things and expand. Anyway, mm -hmm. so I did so. And that was absolutely the best course ever for me. Uh, because it wasn't about qualification, because they weren't at the end. Um, it was giving everybody a second chance, largely, because we had some architects on that course. We had a brilliant painter who was in a wheelchair, a fantastic artist. We had all sorts of backgrounds there, people from the medical world, etc. And we were a very gregarious bunch. And mm. in fact, certain tutors wouldn't come out drinking with us afterwards, um, because they knew they were getting trouble <laughs> getting home. Um, but it made me buzz when Chris Hoff picked up on my drawing. I mean, we tried all these different things. You know, I even got 100% for performance art, even though I wasn't doing performance art. I was just being <laughs> myself. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he picked up on my sketches. He saw my intense mark making on sketches. Um, we'd gone out to Greenwich to do some sketching there. And he, he, he said, I love those intense sketches. You're, you're very good with a pencil. I dare you to do that at A1. Big. And mm. so to do this abstract drawing, which was of a riverbank, Took me six weeks. I was drawing with both hands at that point. And, really? Um, yeah, because it was all little marks. I'm not as good as that hand with this, but I'm almost. You can and do I was that. getting tired. Oh, and, and, uh, and then I was using the rubber with that. And I, was, and I wasn't really paying attention that I was doing it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and he noticed, he stopped and looked at me. I was using the rubber in that hand and a pencil in that hand. I was like, let's get some white here, put the pencil there, clean that up. Um, so, but um, no, I loved it. And that, that particular picture ended up at the end of the course being one of the main pieces on the wall. And uh, only had another very good, we had several good tutors, and another one who got me doing abstraction process. Um, he was very good, uh, Graham Seaton. And, uh, but the last term I met um, my mentor, a chap called Brian Hodgson. He used to teach etching at Camberwell. And um, fabulous man, and uh, we just clicked. He said, "You do realise you're officially mad." Said, <laughs> Did what? he say that? He said, "Yeah, you do realise that, don't you?" You know, it takes one. It takes <coughs> one to to know another. It takes one to know one. He, yeah, he said, "Like like you, I'm also a drawing nut." He'd spent 18 months on one draw. He'd made his platform where he laid on the floor and did this drawing. I think, I think it's really interesting that when you started off talking, you were saying when you were younger that, um, you know, this idea of thinking about fine art and, and it was like, oh, no, no, don't do fine art because obviously you, won't, you need to do something that's more applied, that's going to be much more, do an apprentice, do something practical. And you've gone on this big circular journey and you've come back uh -huh. and, and re-found where you wanted, what you wanted to do with the fine art. Absolutely. I mean, I was heartbroken when I was told I had to get a trade or profession because they, the, the, the maester wanted me to do fine art. That's what I wanted to do. And I was doing quite a lot of conceptual stuff too. And uh, mm. now I was learning, I did, did learning things like Freud and stuff, but I was conceptual things. And I did a sculpture in my foundation course there where explained what it was like to be deaf. So I made this oh. box and I did these big lips on a stick with a mirror in, in between, like a shiny surface between and I carved my my eyes and my nose and you had to hold this thing and you would look through this book and you move this up and down you see yourself looking through my eyes at this mouth and it was explaining to them how, what it was like to be deaf and they were absolutely intrigued but they wanted me to do sculpture and um, so yeah so I went full circle you did. Sandra's so, put a little comment Sandra said I love hearing about people taking courses as mature students. Glad you had such a great experience and you loved it. And it sounds like you weren't the only mature, really, I'd say mature, student on the no, I wasn't course. the only I was 45 when I started that course. Yeah, sure that's uh, quite young, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and there were others as well, similar age. Some were a mixed age group. We had some younger ones too, much younger. Um, but yeah, it, it was just wonderful. I loved it. And, um, and when I come, came to finish course, I was looking at the degree courses and I was most despondent. Cause I remember going to Chelsea, sat in the audience, and someone said, what if our painting's not up to it? Oh, we'll send you to City Lit. And I thought, you pay, what, five grand for this? You yeah, don't teach them anything. You send to City Lit. I've been to City Lit four and a half years. What's the point? And um, so I was taken to the pub by my uh, dear friend and mentor, Brian. It was a Geordie. And he gave me a stand talking to him. He said, right, Vincent, you could either go and do two more years studying 
mm. or you can just get on with it. Mm. And he said, you'll need five different art worlds for all the things that you can do. He said, um, you know, you've got the talent, you've got the skills. He said, you don't have to justify anything. Just do what you want to do. It's your art. I know there are times when you want to do something very detailed and there are other times when you need a relief and you want to chuck a pot of paint at a wall or a canvas. And he said, but you don't have to justify it. Just keep abreast of what's going on. Um, so you'll need five different art worlds and you're coming on my etching course because you've got the mentality for it and I want to teach you to engrave. So I went did his Saturday courses at Campbell. I loved that too. Um, it's just incredible, all these, all these different courses. You've had a few comments. So um, Sumi has said, yeah, Brian's fabulous etcher. And she said, Brian is a fellow looper and shows with us in loop. I don't know what loop is, but maybe... That's right, know. yeah. That's, that's right. I, I, I know Sumi. Yeah, it's um, incredible etcher. Um, I don't know what looper is. What's loop? Sorry? What's looper? L-O-O-P. L-O-P-U-P. And maybe Sumi will tell us in the chat. And we've had another, um, we've had another comment. So, how did you feel about being a, a senior student? Loved it. You loved it. I mean, I, yeah, I loved it. I loved being an art student. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I loved it when I was an art student. Anyway, I mean, I went to Mason College of Art, Croydon College of Art, but I really loved it at Maidstone. Um, it just felt, it felt like it was my world. I felt at home there. I never fitted in a corporate world, really, even though I had a very successful career. In the I corporate. found it very conforming. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, it, it was very restrictive. And, and also the trouble with design is you're having to interpret what the interior decorator wants, what the client wants, and then you've got someone from listed building put the camera. And sometimes you get a snooty architect who looks down and you go, I don't see why we need you. We should yeah. do this like that. And then you find out after two or three weeks they realise actually we do need you but you all of that politics and some of the snobbery i had to deal with as well i haven't got time for snobbery i think i look at people as being people i don't care whether it's a dustman or whether it's a queen of england they're people as far as i'm concerned and uh, people doing their job we've all got a, a different role to play in life but no i just felt totally at home in that environment and the tutors were wonderful i mean we had so many wonderful tutors at city there I'd recommend that to anyone. If you want to learn skills or if you want to go off and do the fine art, and in fact, some of the, some of the people that came from Wimbledon and St Martins and Campbell, I was told, I don't know if it's true, when they saw our end of year show at the City Lit, they thought it was better than a lot of the degree shows I'd seen. Yeah. So that was saying something. The standard was so high. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it changed my life drastically. It gave me the yeah. confidence to leave my job <coughs> for 26 years my life, leave that, set up on my own self-employed with the intention of doing my artwork. And the idea was to do the design part-time and do the art, and it was a real battle, because I know I'm very good at what I do, but the jobs are so intense and so complex, I was always fighting for my time. Um, and as time's gone on, I've now got to the point where I'm only doing two days a week on the design, because I want to do my artwork, and I'm doing creative that, yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So, in terms of where you're at now, so, you, have you got the balance that you want between the I feel I'm, and the more pleasurable work uh, drawing that you're doing? Well, I think I have. I feel I'm, I'm getting there. I'm yeah. getting, I mean, I, the, the lockdown for me confirmed everything I wanted to do. I was feeling that way before lockdown, but in fact, I have loved a lot of lockdown because I've loved the calmness, not being bounced from pillar to post every five seconds because well, you can't get into your flow with your you know, I've loved that. And stepping up. And I felt like retiring from design, to be honest, at that point. Because yeah. I just don't... And I, wanted, and I was doing art. I did so much artwork. I did my... I've got here as well. I did my daily lockdown sketch. You did? I did 110 of them. Why I've you got them here. There's... Because um, oh. uh, yeah. you are focusing so, a lot more on your drawing now, aren't you? I am. Um, yeah. So the, these... these because we couldn't get out, I used to sketch a lot outdoors, which I'm planning to do again now we're let out again. So I thought, right, I'm going to do like a daily diary. It's going to be an object a day related to my day. Stuff around the house and the garden related to the day. So, you know, so you could tell I was doing drawing that day, design drawing. And then I was doing um, design joinery details, so it's calculator, scar ruler and uh, architectural drawings, compass, oh. etc. And, um, and then 
So time progress. I usually have a cleaner come to my house. I have to do it myself. Genby hates the vacuum cleaner. So I was able to do that. So, um, you know, there were all those sort of, and the garden, lopping back in the garden. My neighbours were removing hedges, etc., and cutting the grass. It's all these sorts of things to do with my day. Um, that was Easter. So I've been, colour has been creeping into my work an yeah. awful lot more. Because um, I, I am actually a draw, but I'm also a painter, and yeah. I do like colour. And that was typical, that's rather like my profession. That was my sitting room, watching the TV. <laughs> Little sketch. We've got lots of questions coming in for you. So we've got mm -hmm. one here that's saying, so Vincent, um, love your work and your positive mindset. Who are the artists that inspire you? It's very difficult, really. I mean, I am, we are inspired by so many artists indirectly without realising. Because, I mean, obviously, I could go around to galleries and look at pictures and, oh, I really like that work. That's a wonderful me day. Or I really like that work. That's um, a nice uh, drawing. And you don't always realise that it's happening. It does. It does influence us. I mean, growing up, I used to like Rembrandt. My, my art teachers called me Rembrandt. I used to like Rembrandt. Um, I liked um, a lot of the Impressionist work. Um, I loved the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci. I was always hooked on his drawings, Michelangelo's drawings. Um, I loved the old engravings and etchers. Um, and later in life, I, as an engraver, someone who liked to do copper plate engraving, I actually admired Drew's uh, work. His drawings are incredible. His engravings are too. He was a yeah, goldsmith. Amazing. I was taught to engrave by a goldsmith last week with, um, with Lawrence Jenkins as well. Um, so, yeah, so there's all sorts of influences. I mean, I even like some of Hockney's work. You know, it's a vast area of work. Like say even. Even yeah. <laughs> well, because people are funny about Hockney. They yeah, about, yeah. He's a very gifted artist, and I always love his honesty and his passion. What he does, and I love his drawings, his landscape drawings. He's very good. And he's actually a big draw patron. He's in, and people don't really think about him in drawing, but he's an incredible um, draftsman. Very, very good. Very talented. I, I think I agree. I mean, I, I, I love the man. I love his work. Um, so yeah, so I, I love his drawings. So we've um, got another he, another uh, little uh, question. Yeah. This is Sumi. So Vincent is a live wire in the SGFA. He curated and hung our last exhibition in Draw 19 at the Menier Gallery London, A Man of Many Talents. Sumi, just so you know, um, we, I was about to bring up the um, Society of Graphic Fine Artists and we know them, we think they're fantastic, we're hoping that uh, the Big Draw might be able to do some bits and bobs with them. But Vincent, do you want to say a few words about the well, Society? Yes, um, I mean, I, how I got in to, to know about the Society of Graphic Fine Art is because I've been part of Pure for many years and um, in the early <coughs> exhibitions uh, and I remember Marina Kim, one of the artists, saying, you know Will Taylor, who was president at the time, has got an a, a SGFA drawing day and why, why don't you go along? I said, well, can't just take along. I'll have to go and ask Will for his permission. And then Will said, he was so generous. He said, yes, of course, come along, meet us at Marina's gallery. And so he went sketching on the salt, some other sketch around. And I thought, I found my tribe. We were absolutely all passionately sketching outdoors and uh, all equally enthusiastic. Lovely, fantastic people. Just in his book, oh, I, just, I got so excited. So I went to uh, a few of their drawing days. I took part in a couple of their exhibitions at the Menier. Eh? And they said, aren't you ever going to apply for membership? <laughs> so uh, I, I, I applied and I've got, I found a sketch recently I did while I was waiting for the verdict. But um, so I, like, I put my portfolio together and I, I, I talked to Will as well. I said, well, what kind of what? He said, well, put some of your design drawings as well in. So I put some of my design drawings in. I put uh, some of my work in progress and some of my print etchings and my drawings into my portfolio. And you were only meant to take about two sketchbooks. I think I must have taken about seven. <laughs> and and lo and behold, when I get out the taxi, I get out of uh, Chain Crossroads, I get the taxi to um, Red Line Square to drop my work off for the Committee of Twelve to to uh, elect me as an associate member. I got in the taxi and this guy started talking to me. It turns out he was Tracy Emmy's next door neighbour. As, as and as so yeah, we got talking. I said, "It's all, it's all the outdoor house. It's all drawings." I'm going. I'm, I'm, 
I've applied to join the Society of Graphic Fine Art. Oh, what's that, mate? It's a drawing society. Oh, I didn't know. He said, oh, yes. He says, yeah, I, 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 I know Tracy him. Very nice girl. Very misunderstood. And I thought, I can't believe this conversation. Um, it's so it's quite weird. And so I yeah. took the portfolio and went off out. Uh, I went sat in Soho Square or something. I did some sketching. I went around the portrait gallery. did one or two sketches of the portraits and a sculpture there. And I uh, went back and uh, they said, you, you, you've been accepted, well done. When we, you know, I was just glowing, absolutely glowing. I could have floated off in the air. I was really happy. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I became an associate member. And, um, and I've often been involved with pure hanging air shows, to bring up pictures and stuff. And I've previously been on a committee of South East Open Studios. So eventually, when... Jackie uh, Devereaux was president. She asked me if I'd join the council. Oh. So I went on to the council with a, another friend of mine who I know. We both went on there. We're a bit like the two naughty children in the corner, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we you know, you get carried away. But you um, are very involved, aren't you? You're involved in the exhibition. Uh, right, I love being involved. I get... I get a buzz out of it. I love the camaraderie. I love meeting and talking to the artists. I love seeing the artwork. I love seeing it all come together, the whole show, the private view. I love all of that. I absolutely love being involved. In it. And I love the Society of Graphic Fine Art. It really does feel like my tribe. I mean, it has a really interesting history as well, doesn't it? So we would obviously uh, recommend that people take a look at the, the website if they don't know about it. Is it 1919? Or have I made that up? That's right. Yeah, yeah. 1919. <laughs> officially, after the First World War, it yeah. was a reaction to the Cubist movement. How everything was going abstract. I think it was six etchers who originally founded it uh, from St. Martin's, I think. So they would have been in Charing Cross Road. And uh, I think they used to meet in the pub that we go to after our council meeting sometimes. So it's funny how that goes full circle. And um, and our first president was Frank Brangwyn. He's, yeah. he's another remarkable man. He, he's a man of many different talents. I mean, he did architecture, did design, um, did illustration, did printmaking and drawing. And he was a phenomenal man. We've had some really interesting members. It's well worth looking at the history of the SGFA. Uh, we still have some amazing artists and some big names as well, but the, the standard is so high. Yes, yes. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Is, so as, as Sumi just said, the oldest society dedicated to, to drawing. There's, a, there's a, a question here, <coughs> excuse me, for you, Vincent. So somebody said, Sandra said, what is your top tip for people starting their drawing journey? How can they get started and what should they do first to feel confident in continuing? Because we do come across this a lot, actually, at the big draw where well, we get the whole I can't draw mantra all the time. But we will regularly be at events and the children will all dive in. And you see that you see the parents, mummies and daddies, they'll sort of hold back. And the fear is in them. You could just see they go white. It's like, do you want to have a go? Like, oh, no. Oh, no. Um, but once yeah. you've encouraged them in, you can't get them away. That's from right. You. You know, it, it's confidence, and it? They seem to fall it out. It is. A lot of this confidence, not being frightened to make a mistake or to get it wrong. I mean, I that remember... I, I, I mean, I'm a perfectionist, and I, I don't get everything right all the time. And I, we think is sometimes I put my re rejected work to one side and it's got into a show. Someone's chosen it. Think, well, I don't know. Well, that's that. it, isn't it? It's, because it's not just about what you see in it. It's what, it's what other people what other see people see. Work. Totally different. Yeah, but, exactly. My, yeah. my, my dad used to say I was my own worst critic. What I found was, and I did a workshop at the SGFA at the menu, which is a similar thing, but I took part in an exhibition in a gallery in Olferston uh, a few years ago, which was the Baker's Dozen. And uh, it was the architect who ran the gallery, and I think it was his wife, um, and some teachers asked me if I would do um, a workshop with a bunch of school kids. Now, obviously, something I'd never done before. Oh. I enjoyed it. So I got the 10 and the 11-year-olds, and so we talked a bit about it. So they set up some still lifes around this very long table. And so I thought, right, well, we've got to keep them interested. So I said, OK, what you're going to do, you've got 10 minutes, you're going to draw what's in front of you, and then you move to the next seat. And to eventually you get round the table, and you're drawing things from all angles. Mm. And so we did that. And it, we didn't do it for too long. For, uh, and, and it was quite interesting because you'll notice, oh, I see a pair. So they draw a pair. Um, hang on a minute. What part of the pair do you see? 
or the top yeah. bit. So why are you drawing the bottom bit? You're not looking. You just look. It's all you need to do. You need to look. Yeah. And so, so they thought they're going to get bored. So they went off and had their, what we used to call, tuck. Yeah, we used and, to call it uh, tuck. Now it's little, yeah. And they came back and we said, right, and we're going to give you some painting to do. Now you've done that light drawing, we want you to pick one, one of those or a group of those things to paint. So we got them doing acrylic, we got them working thin to fat, dark to light. I had to help someone mix their colours. But there was one boy in that class who I was warned about would be hyperactive. He's uncontrolled, he'd be misbehaving. I didn't hear a peep out of him. He took everything on board. He did the best picture. But his parents took him out halfway through the class. Oh, no, no, no. He's no good at that. I'm not going to do that. They didn't even come to the private view to see his picture. So I went and had a room work with a tea room because he'd painted his biscuits. I said, there's a nice picture there. His parents were. They went and bought it, thankfully. Um, and it's really thing. But anyway, they loved it. They got buzzy. Then I took them out sketching um, around the field and they wanted to sketch the graveyard. I said, no, that's too predictable. I got them looking. I said, the thing is with drawing is also not just about how you th think about them, it's what you see, how you look. I said, look at those tree roots. Wouldn't that make an interesting drawing to, 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 to do? And um, what about that? Oh, so got them really firing. I was told they wouldn't enjoy it, but we had a job to get them back into the classroom. I bet. So, I bet. They got, you know, if you give them a bit of enthusiasm and encouragement, then I got them doing monoprinting. That was mighty messy. The ink went everywhere. But they loved it. Yeah. And the work they produced at the end of the show, everyone was blown away. And even the teachers turned around and said, you know, I learned a lot from you. And so I didn't know about these techniques, about how you paint art, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so when they had their exhibition, I mean, there was one boy who said, I just want to paint the Bourneville biscuit. I said, okay, paint it big. Paint biscuit. it big. Oh. Blue background. And it looked like a contemporary piece of art. Yeah. So everyone was blown away. You go, oh, I, really want to see, I really want to see that now. I want to see that drawing of that Bourneville biscuit. I, said, I know. Um, <laughs> I got it, but, um, but, Vincent, just to say, we've only, got about, we've only got about five minutes left. It oh, sorry. Just, but so it, that's a way to get them in. And so I did the same thing when I only had a few people, but I did the same thing at the menu. I got my rucksack out, I gave them all some pencils, some paper, and I showed them about mark making and line and got them to sketch what was in front. And there was one lady there who struggled for a few years to get back into artwork. And it was just a simple thing of saying to her, well, look, maybe try a softer pencil. And yeah. I did it for her. Yeah. So it's finding the medium suits. But so they I mean, pick I, up on passion. Yeah, they pick up on food. Just a couple of the things you were just saying. So, so yeah, we've got about five minutes. So this, to round off, because I knew this, it's always like this. I mean, I could just chat to you for hours, but it's this idea that you talked about. It's something that, as you know, is, is, is central to the, the big drawers, or this idea of drawing to see, you know? So, um, yes, you can learn to draw, fantastic, but it's also the drawing is also the learning. So, the, the drawing is a process of helping you slow down, see, yeah. and take stock of what is around you and what you choose to focus on. Um, and then there's, there's the whole thing around as you slow down and calm down, actually, that's quite relaxing. And people are doing that. Uh, I, I think they're that's quite, right. well, it's quite it, mindful. It can be quite yeah. intense. It can be quite intense, but it's very satisfying. It's it satisfying, just, isn't the, it? Get in the, the beauty of drawing, it makes you look. The more you see, you the look. more you draw. And the more you draw, the more you see. Yeah. And you can't get that with a photograph. I would tell anyone who wants to draw, learn to draw, chuck the photographs in the cupboard. Work from life. Every yeah, time. That, oh, That's what I do. Flat. You can't do it from. No, it doesn't. See any shadows are black. You see into yeah, the shadow. Yeah. You don't get the experience. I sit there. I get the story of people telling me. I get the whole weather thing, and you, you take so much in. And you come away. It's in your memory. And then when you're doing a piece of artwork from it, and it's not about copying a photograph. That's great for skill. But you want a bit of interpretation. It's much more fun to show the marks, interpret, and play with it. It really is. I mean, I mean, I think this thing with drawing as well because I mean, I I sketch. I, mean, I like to sketch and draw, and you know, it's, it's a hobby. And you know, I don't see it as a, as a professional or anything. But I do find it very relaxing. I do find that I can get into the flow, and I find that I can be there and think maybe ten minutes has gone, and like two hours has gone by. That's but right. it's that it's that idea of what you choose to focus on. So I mean, so for example, you know, I've got a cup of tea here. Yeah, lovely. Um, it's just this idea, isn't it, of um. 
you know, if we're all sat round, so there's you, there's me, there's a bunch of us, we've got one thing that we're all focusing in on. We're all going to look at different parts of it. We're all going to focus in and zone in on totally different That's aspects right. of it. Some and we've all got our signature. Yeah. yeah, some people will see the line or some people will focus more on the shading. Some people might want to get a sense of the whole and some people might just focus on one tiny That's aspect right. of it or one particular plane or something. But if you're really looking and slowing down, and it's incredible because then you get into that whole thing about, well, actually, is what you see the actual reality of the object or is it the object, which is a whole different conversation. But people see, they really do see in different right. ways. And it's how it's you good. remember things as well. That's why it's so important for children to it's, learn. It's it should be a, a major thing. And anyone wanting to do architecture design and they've got to use a blessed AutoCAD, which is a nice machine in its own way, but it's but flat, it's dirty, flat. Don't, don't do it unless you can draw. Go and draw. draw. And if you're on a building site, as I do quite often, you've got to draw what's there and then draw the solution. Some people have sketch. You haven't got time to go back to your office and put it on a computer. No, and half the time, they can't understand it. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think and it teaches you to understand line weight, etc. And they have to do all these 3D modelling on the computer. When you draw from life and when you've designed 3D, it's up there. I can visualise it. I can mm. visualise in my head where a pipe goes through a building. Mm. Yeah, I can visualise it. So when I'm drawing, I can draw from my imagination. I've got a painting when I go to my imagination. I am seeing it in my head. Yeah. Um, and that's coming from... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've got literally one minute or maybe two. Oh, right. I mean, what would you... I mean, the first thing is, if people want to find your work, Yes. Your website. What yes. do you want to tell people what the website is? Yeah, the website is uh, www.vincentmatthewsart.co.uk. Um, and and you're got, on social media as well, aren't you? So people can find on, you. Facebook, on Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter. I'm on those. And well. obviously, what we'll do is obviously this will sit on our Big Draw's Instagram live account anyway, just as a resource. It'll just sit there and it'll stay there. So people can come back and, and listen to Vincent again, revisit that. We'll also lift it and we'll also go and we'll put it onto YouTube as well, Vincent. So we'll be able to share that that with you if you want to share it with, with other people. Oh, thank you. Yes, that'd be good. I've had a few friends asking if they Oh, yeah, no, so we'll definitely. So we'll be sharing it much more widely. Um, in the last minute or so, what would be your final words in terms of drawing? Your tips? Fine, you know, as a sort of a final... I think like drawing, my, my point would be drawing is a vital skill. It's a vital skill, Not it's one thing that makes us human. It separates us from all the other man, mammals we draw. Yeah. We've been doing that since caveman. But if you want to go, even if you're a biologist or a scientist, drawing is a good way of analysing what's in your head on paper. But anyone going into a visual creative world, whether you're going to be working on a computer or anything else, my advice would be to draw. Draw and draw. draw keep more. drawing. Draw, draw. draw. Keep, keep drawing. doing. Keep drawing. <laughs> and keep practice drawing. or help. Don't and don't be ashamed to go off to City Lit or something else like that and do some of their drawing courses. Yeah. We're going to have to leave it there, I think, Vincent, because we're going to run over otherwise. Um, but yes, absolutely. Party words. Draw more. Keep drawing. Draw more. It's important. It's the centre of everything. And we can... If we want, if you want to do another one of these, Vincent, then we can just do another one again and pick up where we left off. Maybe yeah, more, happy to do that. Maybe yes, more yeah, industry happy. or something. So yeah, yeah, so me just said all scientists draw. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of our <laughs> patrons and ambassadors partnerships, they're all working cross sector and looking at how drawing underpins a whole range of different um, different professional industries and practices. So absolutely, right. very very important. But also for your health and to express yourself. Absolutely. It's, I mean, I find if I get in a dump, I just do a bit of artwork. Do a bit of drawing, yeah. And if I get a mental block, I go up with a sketchbook. Yeah. I'm soon back in the groove. Do you know, I could chat with you all day, Vince. It's such a pleasure. Right. <laughs> it's so lovely to chat with you. Um, it's just, it's so easy as well, because I know that we have the same interests and passions and we're on the same page with it. But we're going to need to wrap it up. But I think, thank you to everybody who joined us today. As I say, we will... We will put it on the Instagram Live. It'll go on uh, YouTube. Check out the uh, website. So check out Vincent's website. Have a look at the Society of Graphic Fine Artists website. Have a look at the Big Draws website. And, and make sure you're following us all if you're not already. And, um, and maybe we'll do another one of these, Vincent, in a, a couple of months. Thank you. It's been yeah? a pleasure. Yes. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who joined us.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.